Good morning. Good morning, church. So lovely to have all of you here in the building on this Resurrection Sunday. I want to welcome everybody who is joining us online, also those who are joining us on the radio. You are so, so very welcome. I wonder if you can take a stand and greet somebody next to you. You may see that we have the young people in the building this morning, our C4G and our Reverb is with us. So please take a moment just to greet somebody. We do have our pastor on duty this morning, Pastor Clarence. He will be on my right-hand side, your left-hand side. As you sense a word from the Lord that is for the congregation, please feel free to come and share with him, and he will discern whether it is a word to be released in this morning service or to be shared with our leaders later on. I wanted us to just start with uh, just the scripture around the resurrection from Mark 16. Mark 16 from verse 2, it says, Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side and they were alarmed do not be alarmed he said you are looking for jesus the nazarene who was crucified he is risen he is not here see the place where they laid him but go and tell his disciples and peter he is going ahead of you into galilee where you will see him just as he told you the thing that stood out for me this morning is the invitation from the young man to come and see where he was laid. It was the Lord was inviting them to have a personal experience with the resurrection. He was saying, don't just believe it, but come and see for yourself. And I almost felt as if the Lord is inviting us this morning to not just remember our historical evidence, or not just to remember that it's Easter and we know the story, but to come for ourselves and to see for ourselves, almost the invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good, to come and see where he was laid. God wants you to have a personal revelation of the resurrection for yourself. And from, there, from that place, once you have come and you've seen and you've experienced, it will be easy to then go and tell, because that's what he calls us to do, is to come and experience him and to go and tell. So I want to just pray for us as we come and behold the Lord this morning, as we remember that he was risen, as we remember that we, we come and we do not have to roll away a heavy stone this morning. It's been done for us. The way has been made open for us to, to know the Lord, to encounter him, to experience him. There's nothing heavy or there's nothing difficult in front of him that prevents us from experiencing him. And even if there is something weighing heavy on your heart this morning, trust the Lord to roll it away for you so that you may encounter him. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that any stone in front of us, you are able to roll away so that we may come and see for ourselves. We may experience the resurrection life for ourselves. So this morning, Lord, we want to come and present ourselves early on this Sunday morning. We are coming to you and we're presenting ourselves to you. Will you show us, show us just what it means to us, what the resurrection means to us personally? Help us to see in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Good morning, family. I'd like to invite you to stand up as we praise and worship the Lord.
minute to lift up the name of Jesus. The instruments did it so beautifully now. Use your voice to just exalt his name in your own language. However you need to do it, just lift up the name of Jesus. Father, you say that if we don't cry out the rocks will do it and today we choose to cry out to cry out the name of jesus the name above every other name the name above every other name father thank you that you are both the lion and the lamb you died for us you were slain, but you are the all-powerful one, the almighty one, the risen one. And this morning we celebrate that. I pray, Father, that you will reveal to us your fullness, that we will not just see you as the lamb, or we will not just see the lion side of you, but that we will see all of you. I pray that as we worship you, we will acknowledge your fullness, not just what we like, not just what we feel safe with, but all of you, all of you. Father, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to fix our eyes on who he is, who he is to us as individuals. Father, show us who you want, who you want us to acknowledge today. The lamb, the lion, our all-consuming fire God, our God who is our provider, our God who is our healer, our God who is our comforter. I pray that as we behold you, you will help us to hold on, to hold on to you, to hold on to your truths, that we will not give up hope. We will not be discouraged. We will not grow despondent because you are alive. We serve a God who came out of the grave. We don't have a grave with a Savior in it. We cannot go to a grave site in a sense because you are not there. 
we do not have to go look for you among the dead because you are alive and and we celebrate that today lord thank you so much that we can be alive in you we can be alive in you we've been risen with christ thank you that you have hidden us in you we can partake of your resurrection as well amen amen Amen. As we transition to the offering, <laughs> I almost think our offering is in a worshipful space this morning. <laughs> I want to read from us from, to us from Malachi 3, verse 10. The invitation to the woman was to come and see where he was. Come and see where he was laid and he's no longer there. I think even in our finances, the Lord is inviting us to experience His goodness, to experience His provision, to experience what He can do. Malachi 3 verse 10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. I think the thing the Lord highlighted for me this morning is just to test me in this. Experience it for yourself. See that you can trust me with your finances. I am faithful. I can give to you much more than what you can ever anticipate. I can provide for you. I can look after you. You can test me in this. We can experience him as our provider. You would know that we have different ways to give in our congregation. So if you are online, you are so welcome to use the SnapScan QR code or the EFT details that appears on your screen. If you're in the building, I see the bags have already been passed down the aisle. If you want to give in cash, you are so welcome to do that. I just want to pray for us. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you did not abandon Jesus to the grave. Thank you that when you speak your word, when you say something in your word, it's true. And we can take it to the bank, literally. Your word is true. You do not lie. Thank you that we can experience you in your resurrection. We can experience your faithfulness in our finances. We can trust you in all of our lives with our eternal salvation and with the practical detail of our everyday living including our finances thank you for your faithfulness in that in jesus name amen i want to invite anybody who is a visitor with us this morning I'm not sure if you can give me a show of hands if you are visiting at Hatfield, maybe for the first time, um, or if you've been visiting for a a number of weeks, a number of times, you are so very welcome. I would love to meet with you directly after the service in our Connect Lounge. It's in our foyer hall, straight through the back doors to your left hand side. Um, I will be there and our team of volunteers. We would so love to tell you about who, who we are. Who is Hatfield? What do we believe? What are our values and how do we live out our discipleship journey with the Lord? So please join us for a cup of tea afterwards and for a a short connect. We promise we will not keep you long on this Easter, Easter Sunday. Just two quick things. If you have not had a chance to to go through the journey of the different stages of the cross that we have set up so beautifully. Um, You still have time to do that. There will not be a guided, facilitated journey, but you are so welcome to go. Um, It journeys from the Last Supper all the way through to the resurrection, um, different stages of the cross, and it's wonderful for you to to be able to do that. You can go directly after the service or for the rest of this afternoon. Um, I think everything will be taken down on Tuesday, so you do have time to still participate in that journey. Really want to invite you to do that. It starts at our prayer room, so you can go there. And just a a heads up to the, um, the parents. 
our C4G, which is the children's ministry, and Reverb, our, our high schoolers' ministry, starts again next week, Sunday. So you are so welcome to bring them. I want to welcome Pastor Louis. Morning, family. This morning early, well, Liam, one of our sons, burst into our room without knocking or any announcement and just said, so, he is risen. And uh, so that's how I woke up today. And uh, isn't that wonderful? He is risen. Amen. He is risen. I want to, first of all, just say thank you to this community, to this congregation, everybody that worked so hard to make Friday a very special time. I've just heard such good things from the people that came from our other churches that really enjoyed it together. So why don't you give yourselves a good round of applause and just being good hosts and being so welcoming, and it was a, a wonderful time together. So we've been privileged to spend the last term and a number of weeks in the book of Hebrews, and it's all been building up to this weekend. And uh, so much of the book of Hebrews is built on Old Testament scripture, and particularly some of Isaiah's writings, and that's where we spent some time on Friday, and we're going to spend some time today also on the book of Isaiah and considering the resurrection. But before I, I get there, I just want to pause and, and in a sense, give a shout out, give a moment of appreciation to Isaiah. What an amazing thought that about 750 years before Jesus came as the Messiah. This man prophesied to such detail and such depth of understanding of what was going to happen hundreds of years later. And that is a phenomenal thing. It is quite remarkable that the book of Isaiah, I don't know if you know this, but it's almost the Bible in one book in this way, that the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah it deals with all the judgment, the sin, the sacrifices. It, it, it sounds like the Old Testament in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah. How many of you know, how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. The next 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah deals with the coming of the Messiah and what that means. How many books are there in the New Testament? 27. Isn't it remarkable? That's just a little oddity. But he understood something about this Messiah that is to come. That's why we sometimes call him, or he's called the St. Paul of the Old Testament. He's sometimes referred to as the evangelical prophet because he so profoundly prophesied about this fact that God would come and that he would die for us, and that he would rise again. I think this is remarkable that God did this to highlight, to put an exclamation mark to, for us, to let us know that this that we're celebrating today has been his plan all along. He knew that this was going to happen. He was working towards this, and he set it all up for us. In Revelations 19, verse 10, it is said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I think in that regard, we can recognize that Isaiah had the spirit of prophecy upon him. He was a prophetic man. He was a, a remarkable prophet. He had the spirit of prophecy because the spirit of prophecy is found in the testimony of Jesus. Those who testify about Jesus displays something of the spirit of prophecy. Now, what I want you to note is, when we look at the prophecies of Isaiah, it's not like he just watched the movie and can tell you some of the details of what was going to happen. I don't know if you've experienced it, but like when our kids, when they were younger particularly, they go watch a movie, and then they'd come home, and you have to sit with them for like a half an hour where they tell you the movie. Have you ever experienced that with your children? And you have to listen, and they tell you the details of the movie. That's wonderful. Isaiah obviously saw in the future, but he didn't just see events. What makes his prophecy so much more remarkable is that he had revelation about what those events would mean. He understood theologically. He understood Christological 
and uh, soteriological elements of what would come with Jesus, this Messiah that would come to earth. He didn't just explain the movie that was about to unfold. He told you the why. He told you the, the what fors of what was going to happen. He had a depth of understanding about Jesus. It's like when Jesus said to, to Peter, um, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven revealed this to you. It's like he had that spirit of prophecy upon him. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So he prophesied and he testified about what was to come. Now we live today and Jesus has come. Jesus had come and died on the cross. He rose again. But I want to tell you, we still need the spirit of prophecy today. Amen? We need the spirit of prophecy that is the testimony about Jesus. Every one of us on our front lines, we need the spirit of prophecy. Because you know what the spirit of prophecy does for us? It, it helps us to not only say that Jesus died, but what does that mean? What does that mean for my life? What does it mean that Jesus rose from the dead? What does that mean for my life? What does that change about my life? And what does that change in the, on my front line and in this world, in our nation right now, with so many struggles and so many realities? What does it mean? What does it change? That's the spirit of prophecy that testifies about Jesus. I saw a little cartoon in the week, I think on social media somewhere, and this is a little hand-drawn, like petrol sketch cartoon, and you had the two gods standing next to the grave. And one on the one side, one on the other side, just, you know, standing there with their spears, just minding their own business. I mean, when you get the graveyard duty as a soldier to guard the graves, you don't expect much to happen, do you? You're sort of just standing there, like, bored out of your mind, you know? And there they're standing. And suddenly, in this cartoon, which is, you know, not really what happened, but this rock comes flying out, you know, in the little cartoon with the stripes, and there goes the rock. And it's like the first picture, the two of them standing. Second picture, there goes the rock, the stone that covered the grave. And in the third picture, they're looking at one another. And and the one says to the other, now what? (laughs) And that's the question. Now what? What does it mean for this world? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for your front line? That Jesus rose on the third day. That he is risen that we live in a world where, as Lena said, there's no grave for our Savior that you can go see him there anymore. There's no visiting of the body of Jesus. He has risen. And that's the spirit of prophecy that testifies about Jesus, that we need alive and strong in this world today for the believer. Because in one sense, every believer is a prophet. Do you know that? Because we are all called to be the ones that testify about Jesus, that tells about Jesus, that proclaims the difference it makes in this world that Jesus died and rose again. And so I believe in South Africa at this time, in Pretoria at this time, we need more of the spirit of prophecy. Amen? We need an increase of the spirit of prophecy. Not just the spirit of prophecy where, you know, we tell people the movie, but the spirit of prophecy that helps people understand the why. That, that is not just a, a recounting of events, but a spirit of prophecy that is revelation, that makes us see Jesus. And so this morning, before I get into the rest of the message, I want to pray that. I want to pray for the spirit of prophecy in this community to increase. I want to pray for the spirit of prophecy in this nation. So can I ask you, you, if you wouldn't mind, to stand with me as we pray for this. I'm going to ask those of you that are online and those on the radio just to agree with us in this prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that creation revolves around this moment where you came, you died, and you rose. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we don't just look back upon this event, but that we could see others looking forward to it. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy, the revelation that you gave to prophets, not just Isaiah, but others also, to foretell not only that Jesus the Messiah will come, but to foretell and make us become aware of what that will mean. And we recognize that today, 
We need the spirit of prophecy. We know there's much that is contending for that prophetic space in the world right now. Sometimes, Lord, it feels like there are things in the church that we could put under the prophetic that is not actually helpful to reveal who Jesus is. But we pray, Lord, for an increase. We pray for more of the spirit of prophecy on the life of every believer that can testify about who Jesus is, that can point to what it means that, that Jesus is alive, what it means for them, and what it means on their front line, what it means for the world around us, what it means for our nation today. We pray for the spirit of revelation in Jesus' name. Thinking of this election coming up, we need revelation, Lord. We need the truth. And so I pray, Lord, on every believer here that's listening to me and praying with me, I pray for the increase of the spirit of prophecy on us in Jesus' name. I pray for the increase of the spirit of prophecy on your church in this time. I pray for the increase of the spirit of prophecy in this nation and in this world that we will see Jesus. And that when others go, now what? We can say, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus. And I thank you for that. And we receive by your Holy Spirit right now. Won't you just with me take a moment and say, thank you, Jesus, for the spirit of prophecy that is on my life. And I can receive right now the working of your Holy Spirit. I'm willing, Lord. Here am I. Send me. Send me in the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. And I thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And let's all say, Amen. 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 So I want to remind you just quickly of some of the things Isaiah said about the death of Jesus. And then we're going to move over to the things he says about the resurrection of Jesus. In Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 12, I'm just going to read the list. I'm not going to comment about them. We spoke about this on Friday. He said, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was stricken by the transgressions of my people. He will bear the iniquities. He will bore the sin of many. He bore the sin of many. And so we have, as we did on Friday, we focused on the cross. But we must always remember that this time, Easter time, Passover, whatever you want to call it, it's a twofold reality. There's a death and there's a resurrection. Without the resurrection, the death would actually not mean a whole lot. Without the, without the resurrection, we would have a pretty dark faith, a pretty hopeless faith. But because of the resurrection, there is hope in our proclamation of, of faith and of what Jesus did. And so it's wonderful that when Isaiah prophesies, he not only sees the death, but he also sees the resurrection. And, and, and the wonderful thing about the resurrection is, you know, the death has a net natural element to it. Jesus dying on the cross, do you understand what I mean when I say it's a natural element? That, that can happen. The resurrection, on the other hand, <laughs> is supernatural. That can't happen. You, you can't make that happen. And the fact that Isaiah prophesied such detail about both the death and the resurrection sort of causes us to sit up and go, okay, the, the, there's something here. But the resurrection is something that he saw. It's, it's to me in the, in the same space of, of somebody like Noah seeing a world flooding while he's never seen rain before. He doesn't know about water pouring from the skies. Yet he prophesies a flood. Isaiah prophesies a resurrection, something that is completely outside of his frame of reference. But he understands something of what God is doing. And so in Isaiah 53 verse 10, we read three things that he says that, that begins to hint towards this resurrection. He says the following, He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. When he prophesies about this what we spoke about Friday, the suffering servant. And then he talks about what I just listed, but then he moves on and he says, he, the suffering servant, will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. 
There are three statements in there that I just want us to pause with for, at with for a moment. He will see his offspring. Remember what Hebrews said when we studied Hebrews? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. This scripture tells us, not only did he go through the cross crucifixion because of the joy that he anticipated, but he actually saw that joy come to pass. He didn't only live in the anticipation, he also lives in the reality. You see, if Jesus didn't rise, then he would have gone to the cross hoping that this would make a difference. But because he rose, he lives and he sees the result of the crucifixion. He sees the offspring. For the joy set before him endured the cross. He's now in the joy. At the cross, as Debbie described it for us so beautifully on Friday, it was the horror. In the resurrection, we see the hope. He not only had the horror, the enduring of the cross, but he now lives in the joy of the cross. It's like Jesus is saying today. He looks across the earth and he says, it was worth it. I'll do it again if I have to. It was worth it. Now, he doesn't have to, but just as a saying, it was worth it. Because look at my offspring. Look at the children that has become born to the kingdom because of that which I endured on the cross. So that tells us How is it possible for him to see the offspring? Because he's alive. You can only see the offspring if you're alive. He saw the offspring. He sees the offspring. He will prolong his days. Isaiah says, now please keep on reminding. For you and me, we're looking back. We have Romans. We have Hebrews. We have Galatians. We have the Christology developed that tells us all these wonderful things about what Jesus did on the cross and and explains to us the power of the resurrection. This is a man, 750 years about, looking forward to what's going to happen. And he says, after Jesus died, his days will be prolonged. What does that mean? He will continue to live. That will not be his end. He's already telling us this person, the suffering servant that dies, his days will be prolonged. It's a, it's a way of describing that he will live for eternity. Don't look for him among the dead, look for him among the living because his days will be prolonged. And then he says the third thing, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So not only did he do the will of the Lord when he went to the cross, but he will continue to do the will of the Lord after the cross. That's only possible because he will live. His work's not finished. He didn't go to the cross and that was it. That was merely the beginning. His work continues. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And that will of the Lord, that continuous working of the Lord, he was the author. What does Hebrews say? The, fix your eyes upon Jesus. The author and the perfecter of your faith. So he did the cross, but in the resurrection. So perhaps in the cross, he did the authoring, and in the resurrection, he does the perfecting. He doesn't only start the process, he leads it right through to its completion. In Revelation 5, verse 5, we read the following. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Don't weep at the dying. Look at what is going to happen. That this one that died, he will do the work of the Lord and it will prosper in his hands till the point where he will be the one that will open up the scroll and he will bring everything to its logical and complete fulfillment and conclusion. So what is Isaiah telling us? His work started on the cross. And he is still completing that work. He is alive. Now why does that matter? Why does it matter that he is alive? What are the ongoing results that you and I experience today because of this fact that we proclaim he is alive? I know it's sometimes a difficult thing 
to tell people that we believe Jesus rose from the dead. Because again, as I said earlier, to say to people he died, they go, well, lots of people die. He died a horrible death, lots of people die horrible deaths. There's a natural, explainable side to that. But when you go to people and you say, well, we don't only believe that he died, but we believe he rose. And we don't believe symbolically rose. We don't mean euphemistically rose. We mean rose, like dead, alive. We, we believe there's a day that you can go back in history where one minute he was dead, wrapped in cloths inside of a grave. Joseph of Arimathea's grave, he was lying there, dead. Dead. Busy decomposing, if you want. Dead. Dead like any other person would be dead. Can I describe dead to you? Even? Do you get the point? Dead. Not a degree of death. You don't have a little bit of death, somewhat dead, really dead, and truly dead. You have dead. He was dead. And then suddenly, he's alive. We don't mean degrees of alive. We mean alive. We don't mean somewhat alive, a little bit less dead, not looking like he's not dead, not talking about better makeup. We're talking about alive. He's alive. And your problem and my problem is we believe that really happened. Like just yesterday, I ate too many hot cross buns. It really happened. Praise Jesus. <laughs> he really rose. We don't mean it allegorically. We mean really. And that's the basic of our faith. Sometimes people will say, uh, we like Jesus. He's a nice guy. He's, he's a guy I can, I can follow. He's a guy I, I believe so much of what he was teaching. And he was a peaceful person. He was loving. He was so caring. If you can just dial down on the resurrection stuff, how he came into this world and how he went out of the world, if we can just put those aside, let's not make that a big issue. If you want to believe he rose from the dead, that's fine, but that's not true. And so if we can just mainstream Christianity a bit, just make it an, you know, the problem is we really believe he rose. Amen. And I want to tell you, if you want to be a Christian, a Bible-believing Jesus-focused, centered Christian, that's what you believe. He really rose from the dead. Can I explain it again? He was dead. <laughs> dead. Not degrees of dead, dead. He's alive. Not degrees of alive. He's alive. Fully alive. And that's what we believe. And that's what Isaiah foresaw. That's what he, through revelation, began to declare. And why is it important that we believe that? He mentions three reasons for us. He uses, uh, sorry, he, in, in verse, two, let me, sorry, let me go back to the scripture and read it for you. From verse 11 of Isaiah 53. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Again, remember, he's looking forward. He's saying, this suffering servant that died, this is what now happens after he died. He will see his offspring we spoke about earlier. Now, if he takes, teases that out a little bit more, he says, he sees the fruit of his death and is satisfied. Isn't that a beautiful word? Today, Jesus is satisfied. Like I said earlier, he says, I'm so glad I did it. It was worth it. I'm satisfied. He looks over creation, and he is satisfied with what has become possible, with what has happened. He is to be satisfied means you're alive. He is not dead. His work in terms of the cross is completed, and he is satisfied with the results that it delivered. Because he rose from the dead, therefore we can be alive today and rise from the dead. If Jesus, 
went to the cross and died and paid the price for our sins, took all the judgment, there could have been some level of forgiveness possibly for sin. But you and I would still struggle with the curse of sin and death. But Jesus rose on the third day. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? What was the ultimate victory that had to be won by Jesus? Was the, the victory over that which was the result of sin, which was the curse of death. Jesus went and conquered death. Beat death. C.S. Lewis puts it in the following way. In his book, Miracles, he writes, The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits, the pioneer of life. He, forced, he has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has been opened. Before Jesus' resurrection, if you died, you died. You were dead. Dead in your sin. There was no other option for you. But since Jesus went into death and conquered death, and escaped the clutches of death, and broke the chains of death, and rose on the third day, he said, I have done so, so that if you believe in me, every one of you will do the same. You will break the clutches of death, because I've done so. That's why for us, Paul says in Thessalonians, he writes to the Thessalonian believers, in, in 2 Thessalonians 4, he says, we do not grieve like the unbelievers. This week I'm, I'm, I'm doing a funeral for somebody. And as the pastors, we often do funerals, and you go to funerals, and we're part of funerals. At a funeral, we remember somebody's life. We celebrate their life. We thank the Lord for them. And then we bury them. We say goodbye. But for you and me, because Jesus died and rose again, we do not mourn like the unbelievers. We don't say, thank you for your life. It was great. May you rest in peace. We say, I'll see you again. Amen. I'll see you soon. To, we will be together with Jesus in eternity. And that's the hope that we have. That is the certainty that we have. Because Jesus rose from the dead. He rose. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. But if we proclaim Jesus that has been risen, our faith is a faith filled with hope. The second thing he says is he justifies many, all those who trust in him. Now please note the present tense in this proclamation. He justifies many. Not he justified many. He continues to justify. How does that work? What? Because when Jesus died on the cross... He took upon himself our sin, the curse, the division between us and God. Then because he rose and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, or as other scriptures put it, forever interceding for us, whenever you, the accuser comes against you and says, Lord, this one does not deserve, is not justified to have entrance into your presence because look at their sin, look at their failure, look at all the things they've done wrong. They don't deserve. Not only can Jesus point to the cross, but Jesus can stand up in person, lift up his hands and say, they are justified. He forever does the work of justification until the world is wrapped up. He continues to justify he is your justification. Not just because of what happened on the cross, but also because of what happened on the resurrection. We are justified in him. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 22, Paul writes about, in the first Adam we all die, but in Christ we shall be made alive. In Christ we shall be made alive. Alive meaning that I can live in the presence of God. The third thing he says, he will bear their iniquities. 
And again, please note that continuously, he will bear their iniquities. Not only did he bear it on the cross, but in that sense, he forever bears the reality that he's borne our iniquities because he's alive. If you had to walk around in heaven and be aware of the problem of sin and the, ju- and the judgment of people and the, you know, how horrible it is and, and, and perhaps be like, oh, kind of, what are we going to do about it? It won't take long for somebody to say to you, hey, but there's Jesus. He bears the iniquities. Don't worry. It's taken care of. It's done. He's here. He's among us. He's, he's alive. To live, to be the testimony, the ongoing fact that the iniquities have been born and he still bears it. Not in the sense that he's still under the curse of sin like he was on the cross, took on our sin on his humanity, but he has the scars, he says. Your iniquities. And that means that every sin done after the cross of Jesus is still forgiven. You see, if Jesus didn't rise, perhaps it would have been possible then that everybody's sins before, that sin before he was crucified could have been forgiven. But what about us that sinned after he was crucified? But he still lives. He still bears. He still forgives. Because he's alive. He can say, I forgive you. My blood forgives you. Because he's alive. Jesus' resurrection, in that sense, the hope that it brings for us, also becomes a real material hope. In this way, that his resurrection means that the material world matters to God. Because Jesus died in a real body, And remember, after he rose, he still had a body. Now, it was a resurrected body. It was a bit different in that he could appear and reappear, but he could eat. He could be touched. He wasn't a ghost. He was a material being. And this tells us that God says, the matter that I made matters. This world that I made It's not just something that I made for a period of time and then I'm going to crumple it up and throw it away. In this world is the the core of my beauty expressed and I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to save it. Remember last week I spoke about how like, you know, the shaking that will come and the outer husk, the outer layer of the brokenness, the sinfulness, the decay, the dysfunction of this world will be shaken until that which remains is the true original purpose for which God created so that we can come back to a space like Adam and Eve that could be in a material being but also be with God in the spirit at the same time. And we believe that Jesus died, he lives, and one day he will open the scroll and he will wrap up the sinful world and the new heavens and the new earth will be established that will have a spiritual and material reality and that I will live with Jesus. Now, there's a lot there that I don't quite understand, which we will see will be revealed to us one day. But we know this material world matters. His resurrection, his bodily resurrection means that he's not given up on this world. And therefore, again, we need to have the testimony of Jesus that is the spirit of prophecy upon us. Because we are proclaiming that not only is Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords that will reign in eternity, but he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords that reigns now. And though this world does not recognize his rulership, and though this world doesn't reflect his rulership, I know his rulership. And when I'm in this world, let heaven come. Let let heaven come. On earth as it is in heaven. Sorry, I'm tripping myself up. I know that in my life, that heavenly rule can begin to be expressed in this world. In a material way, because the material world matters to God. Because Jesus died and really rose again. He is satisfied today. He is satisfied. We are justified. I can come into his presence. I can live with him for eternity. All our sins are carried by him forever. Taken care of. Any future generations to come, sins taken care of. He's done it and continues to do it. We will never bear those burdens again. And we will never be the same because our Savior lives. And so in Hebrews 1 verse 3, 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So like Hebrews is the bookend of what of Isaiah describes. Isaiah prophesied, Hebrews says this is what happened. He sits at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Our core scripture for the book of Hebrews was Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these witnesses that have come before us, that testify that Jesus is alive. We are surrounded by them. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This is our time to persevere. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider he who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When we studied, as we studied the book of Hebrews now, we saw that Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is a better sacrifice than the sacrifice of the old covenant. Jesus is a, is a better tabernacle, a better place of meeting with God. He's a better temple than anything the old covenant could offer us. We, we saw that while we are in this world, we may, we may feel the opposition of this world. We may have struggles. But instead of seeing those struggles as something that, is, that will break our spirits, we see it as training opportunities, our opportunities to stand against this world, to stand in the face of this world, to stand against its lie, it lies, its pride, its selfishness, and say, no, Jesus is alive. And to stand and to be disciplined in keeping our eyes on Jesus, fixing our, our eyes on Jesus and saying, I will not go back. There's nothing left for me. Anywhere else, I am with Jesus. Now and eternity. And now we have celebrated that he has died for us. Our sins are forgiven. We no longer have to live in the shame and the guilt of that. Our conscience have been sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus. We have been set free. Now we can live and live as a testimony of who Jesus is. Worship team, you guys can join me. So I want to encourage you. Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Whatever comes at you, whatever this world tries to present as suffering or oppression or as joy, as pleasure, as enticement, Let's not lose our fix, our eyes, the losing of our, ugh. let us not take our eyes off Jesus, but let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us go all the way with him, because what else is there? It's, it's the best. He is risen. He is risen. We're going to end our time together today with a piece of spoken word that was originally delivered by Dr. S.M. Lockridge about do you know my Jesus? Do you know him? I'm going to invite our friend Will, who's showing the courage today to come and deliver this spoken word for us. And I trust this will be a moment that will just strengthen and encourage you as we move on from here to say, Lord, we will fix our eyes on you because you deserve our eyes to be fixed on you. So let, won't you pray with me for Will? Father, we thank you just for Will this morning and thank you for his willingness for the gift that he is. And we pray, Lord, that this spoken word, that it will strengthen us, it will encourage us, and it will bring glory to your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After Will has delivered the piece of spoken word, that, uh, as I said, did I say it was done by Dr. S.M. Lockridge originally? Okay, I did say that. As Will has finished delivering that, the worship team is going to take over. We're going to worship the Lord for a bit, and then I'll come and end the service. Thank you, Will. Good morning, church. My king, my king. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of kings. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my king.
I wonder today, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immorally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. And I wonder, do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinner. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. And I ask you again, I wonder, do you do it? He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Hurt couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave, and the grave, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king, that's my king. That's my king! That's my king! Jesus.
So no matter what we're facing in life, He's alive. And He has conquered the grave. We know, we know that His life is within us. And so whatever the enemy tries to do, whatever our own sinful hearts tries to tell us, we know that He's alive. And we have hope. And we have hope in eternity. It may be today that you need to come to a point where you say, Jesus, I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you. Because I wonder, do you know him? Do you know him? To know him is to have him revealed to you. Because you open your heart to him. It's not reading about him. It's not listening to others talk about him. It's to know him. Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, he becomes your Jesus. Becomes your Savior. He becomes your Lord. And so in this moment, I want to again create an opportunity for people, like we did on Friday, to say, I want to know Jesus. I want to, I want to just know, not know about him. I want to know him. I want my whole life to be reshaped by him. I want to surrender and give everything to him. So I'm going to ask us all again to pray the, the sinner's prayer. To ask the Lord to save us, to forgive us our sins. And we're going to all do it aloud. And so just pray this after me if you're ready. If you mean this prayer today for you, it's the first time that you're praying this. Or perhaps it's you wanting to say, Lord, I've, I've wandered away from you, but I want to come back to you. I'm going to ask that as we pray this prayer, just raise your hand and say, see me, Lord. And he knows you. He sees you. So let's pray this together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you died in my place. That you paid the price for my sin. That your blood brings forgiveness to me. Thank you that you rose. That you conquered death so that I can become alive. So today I give you my life, Jesus. Come and be my Savior. Come and be my Lord. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you receive me into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if those that prayed that prayer, if you wouldn't mind, just right now, just make your way to the front. Just come. Our pastors, some of our team's going to be here. They just want to pray with you personally. Just make a point, personal point of connection with you. And just, it's so important. Just take that next step to say, Lord Jesus, I'm serious about this. And I, I want to step out in this. So as, we, as we're going to end the service, before I release the rest of the congregation, I don't want there to be a clash. Please, let's give moment to those that can come forward. Let's give them a round of applause as they make their way to the front. If you're coming forward... Just bring your belongings with you and come to the front and then your loved ones, those that are here with you, will wait for you. But we want to give you opportunity just to the, come to the front right now for those that raise their hands. As I end the service, you're still so welcome to come and uh, let us pray with you. Let us spend a moment with you. It's not going to be long. Please remember that uh, Lena wants to meet with you uh, for those that are visiting and are new in our Connect Lounge also. But may you go in the peace of the Lord today, but may you also go in the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. That you are alive in Christ. That you are the salt of the earth, that you are the light of this world. And may you go in His strength and in His power. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next Sunday or through the week somewhere. May the Lord bless you. Let's give a round of applause to Will and thank him also just for, for that, for our team.